Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together tonight. Lord, we thank you for thy word. I pray that you would you bless your word and what we study tonight, what we look into. I pray that you'd be with me. Help me, Lord, to preach and to bring forth a blessing to thy people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've done for us. Cover us with your blood. Forgive us for our sins. Let your Holy Spirit, Lord, fill us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, the children can go ahead and be dismissed. I didn't really mean this to turn into a series. It seems like the Lord has been doing that a lot for me lately, uh, keeping me on a certain thread when I get into the scripture and staying there. Uh, I know Mother's Day is coming up Sunday, and my mother's birthday is tomorrow. Uh, and again, if she just got on, I want to wish her a happy birthday. Uh, and hopefully she has many more. But the story that I'm going to get into again tonight is the story of Samuel. Uh, and it all happened because of a woman that went to the Lord with a very sorrowful heart. And, you know, we can look at this and understand that all of us at one time or another, and I look around this room, there is not a person in here that hasn't felt some sorrow of some sort. Now, some may have felt more than others. Uh, sometimes in life, there are people that go through horrible, horrible sorrows. Uh, in this particular case, she was a sorrowful, of a sorrowful spirit because she could have no children. The Lord had shut up her womb. She went to the Lord in prayer. She vowed a vow, which, of course, you have to be careful doing that. And women, you should always check with your husband before, before you vow a vow to the Lord. If you understand the scripture, you know, and I've said this before, that if a woman vows, a, a wife vows a vow to God and her husband doesn't know about it, and she makes that vow to God, he can overturn that vow. He can say, hey, you didn't consult with me, and I don't like that vow for you, and I don't want you to do that vow. And the Lord says it's okay. He will disannul the vow. The vow. But if her husband agrees, then the vow sticks. And the Lord will say, well, he's the head of the house, and he agreed. The vow sticks. In her case, she made a vow, and she said, if you give me a man child, I will lend him to you. I'll give him back. And wasn't that the start of an unbelievable, unbelievable run? In fact, that was the start of revival for the whole nation. Now, you wouldn't think that in reading the next couple chapters. But remember this. There's a verse in the scriptures in the book of Psalms, and I want you to go there first. We're going to go to 1 Samuel, but I want you to turn to Psalms, and I want to make this the focal point of my message tonight. And it's a verse that pertains not only to individuals, but it pertains to nation. Anybody know where I'm going? Blessed is the nation as God is the Lord. Okay, that pertains to a nation. But I'm going to one that deals with a nation and deals with people. And this deals with judgment. And today I was thinking about this. There are people who don't believe in God, there are people who don't believe ha there's any accountability for their actions at all. They just do what they want to do, and oh well. If I don't hurt anybody, life is fine. Is that how it works? Don't all of us have to one day give an account for the life we've lived? Doesn't that keep you going for God? Understanding that the Bible says that the judgment of God is considered to be a terror. Now think about this, terror. Have you ever been terrorized? Have you ever been in such, such fear that you were still and almost couldn't move? Who's ever felt that kind of fear? You were in the war. I imagine war can put that kind of fear in someone to see things exploding all around you and hearing the gunshots and hearing the tanks and the planes overhead and seeing fire come down maybe and napalm and stuff they did over there, the liquid fire they threw down into the jungles to burn people up and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, all the bamboo traps and everything else, the mines. Some people will say, I just, the, the rage, the terror, it, it was incredible. It was horrible. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, covered, I froze with fear. Think about your worst terror you've ever had. 
And that would pale in comparison to thinking about standing before a thrice holy God, wouldn't it? Where if you could see him, you would die. Isn't that what people in the Bible, when they saw him, didn't they think they were going to die? The presence of God is so powerful, so holy. And oftentimes we think, well, that's negative. It's not negative. The holiness of God is a very positive thing. The holiness of God is something to be sought after. Be holy, be holy, for I am holy as I am holy. You know, we should try to emulate God, the holiness of God. But people say, there's no judgment to come. I'm not accountable. Who do I have to tell what I do? And who am I going to be accountable for? You're going to be accountable and hear this clear. Every one of us are going to be accountable. Every person who's ever lived are going to be accountable to a living God. And one day, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Can't get around it. We're going to face it one day. Now, in the Bible, there is judgment sometimes on earth. And sometimes judgment follows those to heaven. And this is where sometimes with wicked people, you think, well, look what they're doing. And they're getting away with it. Are they? Just because you don't see their judgment here. I mean, you get a wicked person who lives to be 100 years old and dies a normal death, just of old age. And you say, well, they were wicked their whole life. Why did God let them live that long? They got away with all of that. Did God see that? Some men's sins are open beforehand, right? Some sins are open here, and some sins are dealt with here. In fact, it's probably better to get dealt with here. The Bible says, and other men's sins go to the judgment. They follow after. Should I close in prayer with... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, with a solemn heart searching? <laughs> Have you confessed your sins today? Are you right with the Lord? Today's message, tonight's message, is about a woman who vowed a vow and gave her son to God. You say, well, how, how does that go in here with all this judgment and stuff? God was going to use him. God was going to use that little child and raise him up to be a mighty, mighty prophet and through him bring judgment. You see, sometimes when life can look bad, in it, God has so much beyond the bad that you're going through right now. So much. And we don't always understand what the end will be, but we know the end of the Lord, the Bible says, that he is pitiful and full of mercy. You know, all you got to do is read the book of Job to understand that life can sometimes have its questions. And Job, as great as he was, questioned life as he was going through it because he didn't understand what was happening to him. Consider the end. I want to go here in Psalm chapter 9. This is it, Psalm chapter 9. Psalm chapter 9. And look in verse number 17, and then we're going to go to 1 Samuel. This is just a simple little verse, and probably you might have it memorized. I would think some of you do. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17. The wicked. Okay? Doesn't that encompass those? <laughs> They're wicked. The wicked shall be turned into what? Into hell. The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all nations that forget God. So you have individual judgment, and you have judgment of nations. The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all nations that forget God. I pray our nation never, ever, ever forgets God. But boy, we are on a slippery slope right now, aren't we? On a slippery slope. But there's a remnant, praise God, that's remembering God. There's a remnant of Americans still left. There's a remnant of Americans still praying. There's a remnant of Americans still publishing the word of God and still publicizing the gospel and getting it out there. There's still a remnant of people that are doing it. Now, sometimes the wicked, they get in power, and they reign, and even sometimes preachers and priests and your whole so-called holy people, 
can go bad. And that's what we're looking at here in this particular passage of the scripture. There was a time in the history of the nation of Israel that the priesthood went bad. And when the priesthood went bad, God had to lay judgment down upon the priest. And his name was Eli. And it was through the vow of this woman <coughs> giving up her son, this little, little boy would go live with Eli. And what we learned last week was, is that in a vision, in a dream at night, when he went to sleep, the Lord called Samuel. And he said, Samuel. And at first, Samuel went and he went to Eli. And he said, you called me. And he said, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And he went back and the Lord called again, Samuel. And he ran to Eli. And he said, you called me. And he said, I didn't call you. To go back to sleep. And he went back to sleep. And the Lord called him a third time, Samuel. He ran to Eli. And Eli perceived that God had called the child. God was calling that young boy. You know, just like Jeremiah. He called him when he was just a little child. And he said to Jeremiah, say not that thou art a child. Can't God do great things through children? And hasn't he over time? Sometimes children, you say, I want to get a prayer request. I want to get my prayer answered. I know I'll get that little kid to pray for me. God hears those prayers of those kids. And how many kids have a, have, are in tune with the Lord? You know, uh, there was Samuel and God called him and God said all that he was going to do to Eli. And when he got up in the morning, Eli came to Samuel and he said, what did he tell you? Tell me every whit. And if you hold back anything, God do so to thee and more also, if you don't tell me everything he said. And Samuel told him everything. And Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good unto him. God was going to lay down judgment. And if we follow this story, we get to chapter three. And then we get into chapter four, where the judgment comes. And it looks so bad and deplorable for the nation of Israel that they actually revert to going to get the Ark of the Covenant. This will bring us victory. Sound like a modern day movie? Let's go get the Ark. It will bring us victory. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hollywood took off on that. They said, with well, this Ark, it has mysterious powers. Even the Philistine, they heard that they brought the Ark into the camp, and the Philistine says, whoa, I'm done. God has come into the camp. Was the ark God? You see, mysterious powers? No. The God behind the ark has the powers. Don't worship the ark. It's not, it's not that golden thing that's going to bring you power. You know, so many people today, they wear their crosses, and they have their, their, their little relics and, and things, prayer cloths and everything like that. It's not those things that bring you power. You know, it's because I carry a Bible around and I hold it up and say, I got power, I got power. No, it's not the book. It's what comes through the book that brings power. You know, we don't need those relics in church here, do we? You don't need an idol to help you worship. You don't need a cross to fall before. You don't need those things. In fact, praying to a picture of Jesus or somebody... It's not going to do you any good, is it? God, here, here's the verse. God is what? A spirit. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, I've been around the block when it comes to Christianity. And I know a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I talked to this one man in particular, he said, oh, I just love to go into these great big cathedrals. I love to worship in these great big cathedrals and travel around the world and see these cathedrals. When I'm in there, I just feel the presence of God. Is it the cathedral that brings God? Does God live in that place? Well, that's only the building of man, isn't it? You say, well, at one time he did live in the temple. True in the tabernacle in the temple will thou build me a place to live he told david david wanted to build god a house 
But when Christ came and he started, and the church came in Pentecost, God did not live in a building anymore. He doesn't live in a building made with hands, does he? Where does he live? He lives in us. He lives in us. I thought about that the other day and I thought, wait a second. Can I wrap my hands around it? Can I get my arms around this? Brother, can you get your arms around that? Austin, get your arms around. God lives in us. Everywhere you go, God lives in you. How many amens did we get? How many praise gods did we get? God lives in you. When you get to eternity and you're running down there screaming amen, I'm going to say, who is that? Look at them. Oh, I thought you were so reserved and quiet. I thought you were so introverted. Look. Oh, I just can't take it anymore. Praise God. I'm here. I got it. Get it here. Get it here. God, almighty God, the thrice holy God, took residence in that little heart. God lives in you. God uses you. God calls you to think that God called us to do a work. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. Are you called a God? Are you? Are you a saint? Called of God to be a saint. Called of God to preach the gospel. What a privilege. We look at it as labor. It's a privilege. We have the privilege of being the messenger of God. We have the privilege of having the ministry. You realize every one of us from here all the way around this room and everybody listening on Zoom, you have a ministry. You have a ministry. That ministry is to take a sinner's hand and put it in God's hand and make peace. You have that ability. What is that called? That's exactly what it's called. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile a sinner with God. Two parties that are at odds. To reconcile. You can bring them together through Christ. You have that ability. If you've ever won a soul to Christ, you have done it. You have completed the ministry of reconciliation. And I'll tell you what, there's no greater feeling in the world. None. None greater than that. Okay, now we get to chapter 4 of 1 Samuel. Chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, and we're going to dive now right into chapter 4 of 1 Samuel. And we're going to see that it looks hopeless here. But remember, through every part of life, God is still on the throne. In the bad, in the good, in the mediocre, God is still on the throne. Chapter 4, verse 1, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched besides even Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. Okay, now understand that God tells Eli through, through a messenger that he sends, a prophet, and then he tells him through Samuel that he's going to, in one day, bring judgment upon Eli and his whole house, in one day. And this day comes, okay? This day comes, and it comes very quick, very decisive. God brings fast judgment upon the whole house of Eli in one day, okay? And the Lord used the words that everyone that heareth it, the ears of everyone that heareth it shall what? Tingle. Their ears are going to tingle. Their ears are going to feel this news is going to be such an incredible news that the ears of everyone hearing it are going to tingle. It says, And where the Lord came to all Israel, now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside uh, Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched an Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So if you can't win... Now you got to revert to other things. What's the problem here? 
In the scripture, when Israel lost the battle, what usually was the problem? Now, I heard a lot of people. Somebody say it louder. What usually was the problem? They're not right with God. What else? Not enough faith. What else? Sin in the camp. Sin in the camp. Wasn't that problem? Joshua got down on his face and he prayed. And he said, oh, God, you brought us through there. And, and we went in there and we got beat. The people of Ai, Ai beat him. He went before the God, before God and he wept before God. And God said to Joshua, get up. The reason you lost, Joshua, is because there's sin in the camp. See, we lose battles and we lose power because we got sin in our life and because it comes into the camp and, and it can infiltrate in the church even. This is the camp. Unfortunately, not everybody's in the camp all the time. I saw something on a church the other day. It just really hit me. It hit me so hard. And it was such a good saying. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Why aren't the churches full? I thought, man, does that preach? The tomb is empty. Why aren't the churches full? Think about it. The tomb is empty. Why aren't the churches full? Too much unbelief. No faith. No power. No strength. God is far from us anymore. Sin in the camp. Love pleasure more than we love God. Get up, Joshua. Take care of the sin. And when you take care of the sin, the power will come back. Won't that preach? We take care of the sin in our life, and the power will come back. It's a give and take, isn't it? We sin, and God says, ah, your batteries are getting low. Ah, what happened to him he was so on fire for god uh, i got sin in my life god says i can restore the power just deal with the sin sometimes we're just in dire need of reading psalm 51 what's that deal with Anybody in here ever go to Psalm 51 just to read it, to say, oh, God, that's me? What does it deal with? Oh, God, take not the Holy Spirit from me. Oh, God, my sin, my iniquity, it's eating me up. Whose psalm was that? Psalm of David. Why did he write that psalm? The Bible says there that he wrote that after his sin with Bathsheba. He was unclean in God's sight. He knew it. Had to get it right. He poured out his soul before God. Sometimes it's just we need to get down and, and get dirty with God and, and tell him what we are. And get the thing right with God so that we can have the power restored. You know, God will let sin come into your life. Sometimes he tries us with trials, and sometimes we give in to them, don't we? And temptations, and they overtake us. And we find ourselves groping around. Where'd God go? He didn't go anywhere. God's always there. God's fixed. He ain't moving. We drift away. It says in verse number three. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us the day before the Philistines? See, they knew who did it. When Israel lost the fight, they knew God was not with them. And there was a reason. So instead of them saying, and they should have said this, let us, let us get on our face and get right with God. Amen? <laughs> what did they do? I know what we'll do. You see, sometimes when you're not right with God, God won't give you any understanding. God won't give you any discernment. Take that away. What happened? I used to, no, your discernment's gone. Your wisdom's gone. Your understanding is gone. Your power is gone. 
The Holy Spirit, not moving through you like he did, not giving you that insight like he did. Instead of them saying, hey, we as the elders of Israel need to search ourselves. We need to get down in sackcloth and ashes. We need to get right with God. Where is sin in the camp? No, instead they say, I know what we'll do. Let's go fetch the ark of God. Let's bring that in. That'll bring us the power back and we'll beat the Philistine. Was that God's intention? Was that God's plan? No. No. But it works only, only for a small time here. They put some great fear into the Philistines, but it's not a godly fear. Watch. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. That ark can't save them. Only God could. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Oh, this was a great time. Hophni and Phinehas and Eli and all of them, they were going around. We got the ark of God. We're going to win now. You got the priest and two sons that are just downright wicked. God said, I don't want anything to do with you. Today is the day both of you are going to die. I'm going to smite both of you. I don't care ark or no ark. Now, this is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible when you read this, when it comes to God being still on the throne. You know, there are a lot goes on in the world today. There's a lot going on in politics, things we don't know what's going on. There's a lot of wickedness in this world, things that we don't know what's going on. God knows every whit. <laughs> there is nothing hid from him. Nothing. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And tonight, if you're doing evil, guess who's watching? And tonight, if you're doing good, guess who's watching? And praise the Lord, if you're doing good, let's hear a good shout. Amen. So, Pastor, I don't always do good. That's the problem. I, I don't either. But I'll tell you, a good place to always just make sure you're safe is right there at the feet of Christ. Right there at the feet of Christ. Lord, I'm sorry. How far does that go? Just think of your kids. When your kids did something to you or your wife or your husband did something to you and they came back with a very heartfelt, I just want to tell you, and maybe tears running down their face, I am so sorry. What did that do to your heart? Yeah, you might have been offended by what they did. Yeah, you might have been put off by what they did. You might have been really sorrowful over what they did. Dad, I am so sorry. What does that do to you? Unless your heart's calloused and cold. You grab your child and you hug them and say, I see it in you. I understand. I was upset. You hurt my feelings. But I forgive you, right? And you might not even say all that to make them feel even worse. Just grab a hold of them, hug them, and say, I love you, thank you. If we can forgive, what can God do? When's the last time you just really fell at the feet of Jesus and said, I'm sorry? Maybe you don't need to. But I know that if you're in this world, <laughs> all of us need to. They needed to. They said, nah, we won't do what our fathers did. See, every nation and every people 
should bow before his feet. And they said, we'll just bring the ark. That will bring us victory. Does it? It says in verse 5, and when the ark of the covenant of, Israel, of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. Oh, what a great time, huh? Oh, the ark of God has come into the camp. They were probably playing instruments and singing and shouting and all the earth began to ring. And the enemies heard it. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. But who didn't come in with it? <laughs> we have his piece of furniture. We're bringing the ark in. And God says, go ahead. I'm going to stand back here and watch. Because I'm not with you here. Get rid of the sin, and I'll come in. There isn't a relic on this planet that can save your soul. You could, you could go to sleep in the middle of that ark and die of a heart attack while you're in it. And if you're not saved, your soul will go to hell faster than a bullet. If you could have the cross of Christ, you could lay down on it and fall asleep on it. And if you died of a heart attack while you were doing it and wasn't saved, you would go to hell faster than a bullet. You could have the very cloak that he wore and put that over you. You could drink from the chalice that he drank from. It can't save your soul. That ark had no power without the one behind it. And the Philistines were afraid, and they said, God is come in to the camp. Is he? Did he? Was he? God. God has come into the camp. Why, weren't they a bunch of idolatrous people? Didn't they link up idols with God? God has come into the camp. Whoa, on us. I could just hear this whole thing going on. For there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Whoa, on us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? See, plural, right? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Did they? No, they didn't. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O oh, ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. Now here's judgment, and judgment quick and decisive. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel, look how many, 30,000 footmen. That's about half of Heinz Field. Fill it up halfway. You can get a gist. Get up there and see all those people in that stadium. Clear about half of them out. You got 30,000 footmen that died. Ark of God couldn't save them because God was nowhere to be found because of sin in the camp. But in everything, God is in the shadows and God was moving through it, because watch what happens. Verse 11, and the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it all, the city cried out. And when he, Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, But what meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old. 98 years old. And his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, 
I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, what is there done, my son? I could just hear him trembling kind of as an older man, 98 years old, feeble. What, 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 what is there done, my, 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 my son? What, what is there done? And the messenger answered, answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck break, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he, ju he had judged Israel 40 years. Now, that's not the end. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed for her pains come upon her, came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not. Neither did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory, I can just hear in her dying breath, Ichabod. And she said, The glory departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. You see, sin, unless judged, sin, unless confessed, sin, unless dealt with, brings Ichabod. And I heard a preacher once say this years ago. I've heard many preachers since then use it, and I'm going to use it tonight. I pray God, I pray God that Ichabod would never be written up here. I pray God that Ichabod never be put on your home. I pray God that Ichabod never be put on you or your family. Glory of God is departed. Bad, huh? a bad state of affairs. The glory of God is departed. But in every time there's evil, in every time it looks like wickedness prevails, in every time it looks like the devil gets an upper hand, what does God do? God sends a deliverer. You can be rest assured, God sends the deliverer. Let not your heart be troubled tonight. Don't fret. Deliverance is coming. 